Welcome to today's Vote Her In episode, featuring special guest Sol Flores, Deputy Governor of Illinois. Bi-weekly, this partnership between author and speaker Rebecca Sive and Two Broads Talking Politics shares with you stories of the movement to elect our first woman president and inspirational advice and strategy related to that movement. Enjoy! everyone, this is Kelly Pollack with Two Broads Talking Politics, and this is an episode of the Vote Her In series, a collaboration with author Rebecca Sive. This series brings us the stories of the path to electing our first woman president. So hello, Rebecca, and I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our guest. Well, hi there, Kelly. I'm just thrilled to be here today, as I always am, actually. But I realized on the way to doing this interview that it was kind of a uh, a unique occasion for me, which is uh, our guest today, Sol Flores, who is a deputy governor for the state of Illinois, Governor J.B. Pritzker, is a former student of mine. So I'm like, oh, wow, this never happened before. This is cool. I'm glad J.B. thought she was as smart as I did. <laughs> what we're going to do today, just by way of framing the conversation for our listeners, is um as you all know, when we focus on trying to elect a woman president and what we need to do to get ourselves there and get her there, we're really talking about uh, women attaining executive political power. And we've talked about this a lot. And that's really why I was particularly anxious, I, perhaps to say enthusiastic about uh, having Seoul on the program. She, as a deputy governor of one of the nation's largest states, she has significant executive political power. It is appointed power. She's also the only woman in that position. Although, as you'll hear her talk in a moment, there are other women in wonderful senior positions. And at least in this way, maybe Illinois is showing the way forward. I'd like to think that. So just to kick it off, welcome, Sol. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And we thought that because you were singular in so many ways, in terms of your personal background and your professional background, if you could just begin by sharing with us, you know, sort of what was the from there to here journey uh, for a young woman, a young woman of color, a woman who took an unorthodox route, at least as it appears to me. So we thought if you could just start and share that with us, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So I always think, you know, I always like to talk about my background uh, in terms of how I got here and decisions that I made intentionally or unintentionally or the universe helped make for me <laughs> along the way. And I think like many of us, many of the listeners, um, we've been deeply influenced by our families. And that is definitely um, true in my case. So I am first generation Puerto Rican, uh, Rebecca and Kelly, and my parents and grandparents and aunts and, and all, almost all of my aunts and uncles uh, came to Chicago from Puerto Rico in the 1960s and 70s. And they very much, you know, landed here with nothing <laughs> and, you know, connections to a community of faith, which helped my grandfather get employed and find housing and help my grandmother get um, her children into school. But at the same time, also help them get connected to community. And so I would like to share this story because uh, my first uh, examples from my earliest life of, you know, what is civic, what is political, is actually what my grandparents did. So they were foster care parents for the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. And they did this in the 1970s. And there was a, uh, a lawsuit that uh, uh, culminated a consent decree uh, called the Blue Consent Decree, which essentially, you know, said that if you're going to remove children from a home, you've got to place them into culturally, linguistically appropriate placements. And so my grandparents signed up to do this. And over the course of 20 years, they fostered a ton of kids. Uh, they ended up raising four like their own. They didn't go through a formal permanent adoption, but they raised these three sisters after their, their mother died. 
And so why I say this is because we all lived in this, you know, three-story walk-up tenement on Armitage Avenue in Lincoln Park. And Lincoln Park was very different <laughs> in those days than it does today. But, um, you know, I'd wake up uh, one morning, they'd be like, here's your new primo or prima to play with, which, is, which means in Spanish means cousin. And so I saw my family do this. And for, the, for me, this is really an expression of what family was. So this idea of familia, but also I get like, what was political for my grandparents? What was community, you know, and how were they helping to influence that um, through these actions? And then my aunts and uncles were very engaged uh, in uh, local efforts at UIC in the 70s and 80s, and also really engaged in uh, uh, the Mayor Harold Washington uh, administration. My uncle having worked for him for a while, I have my first experience door knocking when I was 10 years old, <laughs> and I had pigtails, and my mother was smart enough to know that if you send a cute little girl up the stairs and have her ring the doorbell, chances are <laughs> uh, that they'll give you a few seconds before they shut the door on your face. Right. And so that was my first example of canvassing. Uh, and I, again, I share all this because this was a, a really important in terms of influencing, again, what was civic, what was political. And I'll, just, I'll share one other brief story because I think this is also really important. When I was seven years old, my mother and my aunt uh, signed up to be volunteers in a program called Little Sisters of the Poor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were matched was an older woman. Her name was Margaret. And the whole premise of the program, for your listeners who don't know, is you have uh, folks who are matched with a senior who is sometimes living alone or isolated, doesn't have a lot of family, and you just engage them in fellowship and, you know, camaraderie so that seniors aren't feeling so alone. And so we had our senior, her name was Margaret, and she was uh, a white woman in her 80s. And, you know, the only thing I wanted to do at that time was wake up on Saturday mornings and watch cartoons. <laughs> and my mother was like, nope, we're getting on the bus and we're going to go see Margaret. And I don't know what it is, Rebecca, but when I was young, I, I was afraid of older people, right? And and then going to Rebecca's home and, you know, it was cluttered and dark and, you know, maybe not as clean as as I, you know, had expected. And my mother was just at it, you know, and every single week we'd go and we'd visit and we'd, you know, uh, cook a meal for her, do a little bit of cleaning. And I resisted, resisted, resisted. <laughs> and then one weekend, I remember this so clearly, Margaret pulls me to the side and says, so, you know, I never had any granddaughters, uh -huh. but if I had a granddaughter, I'd want her to be like you. So and in that moment, what I got was just an exchange of human love. And I also got, and I didn't have language for it at that age, later on I did, which was that service is love and is an expression of it. Right. Uh, and so that was one of, some of my earliest memories of both my family's uh, influence and the work that they did, and then my direct experiences. And so, of course, and I know we'll get into this, there is, it's no wonder why I grew up <laughs> wanting to do service and, and being called to serve the public. So I wonder if you could talk some about uh, building networks, you know, just from the very beginning of what you were saying, how important it was that your grandfather had the network of his church, and you've got networks through your family. Uh, any of us who are at all involved in politics in Chicago know the importance of networks, but that's true everywhere, of course, especially for women. So if you could talk sort of uh, about how you sort of consciously build a network and, and think about that and how that helps, uh, you know, obviously, you're in an appointed position now. So that's something that you have to have a network to get to. Yeah. So thank you for that. And it's critically important. And I think you should have networks and build them. And some are built unintentionally. You kind of fall into them and you're like, oh, I'm a part of this. <laughs> and I didn't know it. And others, there was an intentionality around it because we are all potentially working on a mission or we're passionate about the issue. And so you both want to contribute and also be contributed to. And so as I think about uh, my work over the last 17 years, uh, having been the founding executive director of La Casa Norte, uh, very early on, I recognized and being a, 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 in being a founding executive director, it's a, you know, I was, I'm a social entrepreneur, essentially, you know, and so we're building this business. It is a mission-based business, but we're building this. And I learned very early on that uh, you have to ask for help and you have to do it in a way that is relentless, <laughs> that is focused. Uh, and I think if you want to be effective, you've got to have these networks 
so that you are actually duplicating and leveraging your time and resources and talent as opposed to spinning wheels or reinventing the wheel. And my initial networks, uh, I remember building You know, and I don't know that I would call it a network. I don't know that I had language for that, (laughs) but I certainly knew I had a list and a community of folks that I went to. And, you know, years later, uh, folks would ask me, I'd speak at graduate classes or speak on panels and people would say, how is it that you were successful or, or, you know, in uh, how, how do you think you came to grow the mission of the work? And I always point to community and AKA networks as being a part of that success. So very early on, some of my initial communities that I was a part of intentionally building were nonprofit ones, uh, and those specifically focused on human services. Um, and, you know, I had a cadre of executive directors that I could call mm-hmm. and say, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with this? How do you deal with that? And I was so fortunate that on the receiving end was an incredible group of individuals who welcomed me into the space uh, who took it upon themselves to mentor me because they saw it as expanding the pie of resources, not as opposed to competing uh, for it, and who also helped open other doors to me. And over time, those networks uh, have transitioned and transformed or been added to. Probably like, I don't know, 10 years ago now, um, I became really engaged as a network of Latinas. Uh, and women and women of color, specifically in the nonprofit sector, uh, and not exclusive to human services, however, but just women working in this sector. And sort of the same thing. It was about building camaraderie. It was about understanding that we are not alone. Uh, This work can be very isolating and very lonely. You can't unload on your employees. You can't unload on your donors. (laughs) Sometimes you can unload on board members, but even then, no one quite knows what you're going through except for another executive in that same kind of position. And so that became increasingly important for me to be able to depend on this group of women. And Kelly, I got to tell you, you know, that has changed transformed over time. And of course, we have a technology uh, is a tool for us today. And I'm on various threads of WhatsApp uh, and text messaging about, about key issues or sometimes about fun. <laughs> right? We know this work is so important and all consuming and the burnout factor is real and it's high. Uh, and the amount of emotional and social energy that we put into the work uh, can, can make it exhausting. And so to have a group of individuals, um, for me, again, it's been women. It's been mentors. It's been other nonprofit executives who I can count on, whether it's for something very technical and logistical, an answer, an introduction, or it's for I am struggling and I am on the verge of tears and burnout here. How can I lean in to you? You know, one of the things that occurred to me while you were talking is, you know, the idea of building a network of like-minded people, but also people who are familiar with the issues you're working on and the challenges those represent. But I, I, and I speak, I guess, from my own experience, this is something we share of making that transition from doing the human service work into doing, you know, government work, policy work, political work, and yet at the same time building on those networks and continuing to rely on them. But I think for the listeners, it would be really interesting to hear how did you go about making that transition and In that context, if you would just talk a little bit about your run for Congress last year, which was certainly a significant marker along that path. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, in doing the work and being the executive director at La Casa Norte, we had a very specific and defined mission, right, to um, help young people and families who are confronting homelessness transition into having the life of their dreams and the things that all of us want, the ability to take care of ourselves, take care of our families, and to have economic, social, and, and health care, and, and have a, a sense of, of independence. And in doing that work, you know, it's not a, a, a particular box that you're in, right? I mean, that is impacted by all sorts of public policies. Um, there is influence of legislation, there's influence of money and budgets, uh, but also very local issues like where a shelter can be when it comes to local zoning issues. And so in doing my work as executive director, I recognized very early on that you can't be boxed into just these two issues. You've got to make yourself available to policymakers, to elected, and to other communities to lend support and voice. Uh, and learn and be engaged. And so throughout my tenure at La Casa Norte, I got engaged 
engaged in other um, civic work. Uh, for example, I was an appointed member of the Zoning Board of Appeals at the city of Chicago. And I got to tell you, Rebecca, I was <laughs> one of five appointed commissioners. Right. And I was the commissioner that had community experience. I was a commissioner that had worked in human services. And I was a commissioner that had been on the other side of NIMBYism, right? And so uh, you know, maybe 10% of the cases I saw actually had to do with the exact type of work that I did, but I brought a voice and a lens of community and experiences that was impactful and helpful in lots of other cases and examples. I was an appointed member of the mayor's task force on looking at the minimum wage uh, in Chicago a few years ago prior to all the recent legislation. And I got to be a voice at the table representing very vulnerable people and saying, hey, look, this is why we absolutely must raise the minimum wage. This is not fun extra money for young people. This is a matter of survival. And so one could say, well, that didn't have anything directly to do with you with your everyday today work at La Casa Norte in terms of getting people food, getting them into shelter, getting them out of shelter. But it certainly impact the bigger mission of what we were trying to do in the vision of the world and the city and state that we were trying to imagine. And so I would say for listeners, it's really important that, you know, you have, I know, limited real estate time, you have limited focus time, but there are other areas that you must engage in, in order, I think, to achieve a bigger mission. Rebecca, you asked me about my run for Congress and how I got here. And never in a million years uh, did I ever think that I would uh, run for elected office. I told you that was my fir my first campaign was when I was ten <laughs> uh, for Mayor Washington at the time, and, and certainly throughout the years have participated in in other campaigns. But as a volunteer on the edges, <laughs> uh, and, and of course being a uh, consistent voter uh, and understanding what that means, and getting my family to vote, et cetera. Uh, and I got a series of phone calls starting at like eight in the morning, uh, saying to me, "Soul, did you hear the announcement that the current Congressman is going to resign, uh, and and uh, and we think you should run. And I got to tell you, Kelly and Rebecca, I laughed, ha ha. I sent <laughs> you know emojis and smiling faces, yeah, ha ha. You know, April Fools to me, April Fools to you. And then the calls got more serious, and the call said, "So, will you just have a conversation? Can we just talk?" And for listeners and for, for Kelly, for you and for Rebecca, we've all had those moments in our life, right? Whether, you know, you're a mother or you're a wife, you're an executive, you're a civic leader, wh whatever it is, where, where you're really like gripped with fear, anxiety, excitement, <laughs> like, wait a second, is this thing going to completely <laughs> change my destiny? And I was, uh, no, 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 no. And the request I got was, will you just have a conversation? I did. I went and I asked two of my mentors, what do you think about this? Uh, and these two members said to me, Sol, why are you getting out of bed every single day? And I said, the mission of La Casa Norte, and what is that? I'm, you're busting your ass for these young people and families that they have the life of their dreams. Can you imagine doing more of that on a bigger level? And that's what Congress could be. And when they framed it like that for me, it was literally like a page turning in a book. And I've had a few experiences like that in my life where literally the page turned. Even in, in agreeing to be the founder, founding executive director of Black Casa Norte, that was also a page turning moment. And I thought to myself, yes. I can let go of my fears, my concerns. Well, not let go, but I can, you know, <laughs> sort of put them on the side uh, and say with earnest and with focus that I will go do this. And I don't know that I recommend doing it exactly how I did it, which was <laughs> I made a decision to run for Congress in 12 hours. Uh, just the timing of how it went and, and, and how I did that. But it was an incredible experience. Right. Uh, it's one that I will never forget. It's incredibly hard. I have a newfound respect for people who do run for public office. It is all consuming. You are asking your friends and family uh, to come on this ride with you. And oftentimes they are not on that ride. I was very fortunate that I had a family and friends who were very supportive of me and a network of support. And I will just tell you this. Two days after losing the election, you know, uh, folks don't realize you have to wrap up a campaign. It's not like <laughs> you won, you lost, that's it. <laughs> you have to wrap up a campaign. There's compliance issues. There's financial issues. You have staff. You have an office. You have stuff. So we wrapped all that up. And uh, by the third day, I was on a plane to go have some beach time in Miami. This is March, right? right and, and having some rest. And I was walking uh, uh, on a sunrise 
on the ocean and it just hit me. And I said, oh my goodness, I just, I, I did that? <laughs> and what I was able to do in the moment, because I think we're always going, 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 going. And I will say I'm the woman that's definitely guilty of, I don't want praise. I don't want acknowledgement. I just want to get good stuff done and, and be in the background. It doesn't have to be about me. But in that moment, I got that I could just acknowledge soul. And I could say, guess what, soul? You were really friggin' scared because I was. And guess what, soul? You survived. <laughs> This thing didn't kill you. And in fact, right. and this is the thing that, and I'll end with this, this is the thing you could be so proud of. You got to talk about ending homelessness. You got to talk about pay equity for women. I got to share my personal Me Too story of being a survivor, of being a young woman that was more than a victim. And, 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 and that felt great. And so in the, in the larger frame of the loss, yes, there was a loss. I feel really proud of the gains, of the narrative, of the friends, of the support that I did uh, have. And, you know, that election is almost um, two years ago or almost a year and a half ago. And I still get stopped on the street in my mm -hmm. neighborhood. Women, I get, uh, and men too, but <laughs> lots of women, I get phone calls, texts, you know, social media messages that say, I really appreciated you sharing your story. And I could never share my story publicly. So thank you for doing it. Mm -hmm. And I so appreciated seeing an Afro-Latina or I so appreciated seeing a woman who worked in community uh, helping to alleviate poverty want to go do this work. And so I feel humbled by that. I feel honored by all the folks that supported me. Uh, and I went back to work and I kept doing the work of La Casa Norte uh, for, for the next uh, seven months. And then my life changed again. <laughs> So Rebecca mentioned earlier how uh, incredible and wonderful it is that Illinois has so many women uh, leading parts of the executive branch right now. Could you talk a little bit about that and the, the significance of that and, and getting to sort of all work together and, and shape the issues? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will also just share quickly on January 6th is the day that I got the phone call from then uh, Governor-elect Pritzker. And, and he'd previously asked me to serve as one of the transition co-chairs. I was one of of five co-chairs, and I never thought that I would move into government or serve in the administration. I was really just focused on, I want to be a great co-chair. I want to make sure that health and human services are a focus of his transition. And on January 6th, I get a phone call. It's actually a, a quick, funny story, I'll tell you. January 6th is also Three Kings Day. Yeah. And in the Latino culture, uh, this is a very popular holiday uh, post-Christmas. And my family had a big party at a bar. And the party is specifically to raise money for uh, homeless feeding kitchens and programs on the west side of Chicago at a church that my family belongs to. And I get the phone call at like 9 o'clock at night. And I see who it is uh, with caller ID. And I try to move to like a quiet area of the bar. <laughs> and I say, hello, Governor-elect. And he says, hello. So, and he's like, are you at a party? And I said, well, actually, I am. And this is what we're doing. And he said, great. Oh, my goodness. I want to find out more about Three Kings Day and what a celebratory holiday it is. But he quickly went into, Kelly, and I'll, and I'll get to your question, but he quickly went into, so I've watched your work. I'm so proud of the work that you've been doing at La Casa Norte. And I want to make sure that every little boy and girl in the state of Illinois See someone that looks like them working in my administration. And of course, he went on to talk about my experience, et cetera, and then offered me the job of deputy governor. Um, but that so hits home to me, what it means to see yourself. And that could mean seeing yourself in your sexual identity, your ability, your disability, your gender, um, your, your, your background, your professional experience, your geography, you know, your socioeconomic upbringing, right? All of those elements. I mean, my grandmother was a stay-at-home mom who was busting her butt to take care of all these kids. And my grandmother grandfather worked in a corporate cafeteria for 30 years cooking uh, meals for the executives. So we grew up poor and working poor and eventually were able to move into, you know, middle class because my mom worked so hard for that. But in serving in this administration and saying yes to it, I knew I was also saying yes to a governor who had a vision for diversity and for really putting, um, putting it into action. And so it's, it's profound how, uh, and, and we've now shared this publicly, um, it is the most diverse administration when it comes to the appointments of women, 
uh, in leadership and extremely diverse when it comes to people of color. And so I feel when I'm sitting in these meetings and I, I wish, you know, listeners could see into some of them. I mean, we literally, sometimes we'll be around a table and the only white men in the room will be Governor Pritzker <laughs> and Deputy Governor Dan Hines. Right. And everyone else is a woman or a man or a woman of color. And that to me is um, so uh, refreshing and real. And it means that our voices are included at the table. Uh, key leadership positions in this administration include um, a woman named Anne Spillane, who's our general counsel, a woman named Anne Caprera, who's our chief of staff, uh, and who is also the governor's campaign manager. And then a woman who is the head of our legislative affairs, Tiffany Newburn, and another woman who is our head of communications, Emily Bittner. Uh, and then, of course, there's a slew <laughs> of women under that and people of color and folks who identify as LGBTQ and folks who identify as having disabilities um, serve in senior roles in this administration. Um, and I, it is so refreshing. Uh, you know, Kelly, over the last six months, I spent time in community, spent time with my former colleagues, uh, other executives, other advocates, other stakeholders. And we look across the table, you know, and we can cut out the first 20 minutes of the meeting, which is them convincing me of why it's so important and poverty in the state of Illinois. <laughs> right. I mean, we are speaking from the same gospel, if you will, uh, when it comes to premise and focus. And so I feel really, really excited about that. So one of the things about premise and focus and, for instance, ending poverty anywhere in the U.S. is the notion that it really does matter what the policy positions are of a prospective um, president. Mm -hmm. And um, I certainly subscribe to the view, and I talk about this a lot in my book, Voter In, uh, to the idea that women who hold office, uh, as men do, but women bring their experiences uh, as women to the office and their responsibilities, which for most women include things like family care and child care, uh, certainly maintaining their own reproductive health. And so I think that we're at a time when we see that there are all these women, uh, you know, several women running for the presidency, at least on the Democratic side, and perhaps we'll have that opportunity to see a president who particularly focuses on those issues and I wonder from your perspective in leadership in a state government, which will be enormously affected uh, by who is the president, how you see that possibility and its importance and how you think about it as you move in your daily work. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't get to c cover this a couple of seconds ago, but along with the incredible women that are in senior positions in the governor's office, we have also been able to replicate that across. Uh, the cabinet, the agent, oh, the cabinet of agencies, which is so exciting. So in health and human services, the head of the Illinois Department of Public Health, human services, healthcare family services, and aging are all women. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, uh, one of them is an openly gay woman and two of them are women of color. So it is so fantastic. And we have, of course, women in other senior roles as well across the cabinet. Um, but the, the fact that there is there and the implications of what it means. So I'll give you, for example, our um, director of aging, a woman named Paula Basta, right. is for the first time pressing our aging policies around how are we thinking about queer folk as they age and their needs. And some of our basic intake information when it comes to aging services in the state of Illinois did not include um, sexual orientation uh, and or gender identity. And so Paula was, you know, leaning into that and said, well, hey, wait, we have to understand where people are coming from so we can understand where they need to go and how they need to be served. Uh, another example of that is Grace Ho, who leads our right. um, Department of Human Services. Grace is a, a, a child of immigrants. Uh, grew up uh, understanding what it meant to have to utilize and, and depend on on human services. And so she brings that framework um, to the conversation around public policy. Um, she previously worked at the Woods Fund working on racial and social justice equity, and she brings that lens as we're looking at DHS, a $6.5 billion agency. How are we making sure that it's getting to communities that need it and that those communities are being served? 
served by people who are trusted messengers, people who look like them, people who have cultural competence and humility and that kind of understanding. So it's incredibly important who ends up in the White House because we have, I think, a really good example of the opposite, <laughs> what we're dealing with now uh, based on who is in the White House. And we've seen it. We've seen the attack on women when it comes to um, the gag rule with Title X and abortion and reproductive health care services. We know that disproportionately impacts women of color and immigrant women uh, and working class women. Uh, we've seen it uh, with the public charge rule. And we, know, we potentially have a generation of young people who are citizens and who have every right to participate in our benefits programs and their parents and their families are scared of their status and so are pulling them from public health or pulling them from food stamps programs uh, or other public benefits because of this fear. Uh, and I got to tell you, that 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 is so short-sighted and detrimental, and it impacts us in so many ways. It doesn't just mean that that kid isn't going to the doctor. It means that kid isn't getting what they need in order to thrive, and that kid is still going to grow up here and still be productive, unproductive, somewhere in between based on what we've done. You know, we know that when we have less participants in SNAP, what does that do to our local grocers and business and jobs there? Right? So there is a significant domino effect with this. So it absolutely depends on who is in the White House and and the and public policies that are coming down, and you know we so welcome an opportunity to work with an administration that is not homophobic and racist uh, and openly um, hateful towards the communities in Illinois that we embrace, that we want to support, and that we want to protect. So I just wondered, as someone who's just recently gotten into sort of formally being in government work, if you have any advice for the women listening who are, are interested in a, a path like that, especially ones who haven't been thinking about it until they're now in their 40s, like me. Yeah, <laughs> like me. Yes, and you. <laughs> uh, here's what I say, and this is not great English grammar, but <laughs> I would say be less scared faster. <laughs> uh, and when we have opportunities to lead Sometimes they're not always presented in really beautifully wrapped Tiffany blue boxes with white bows, right? Sometimes it's scary. It's unknown. Um, the path is not there. I've worked with an executive coach who's also a good friend for years. And Kelly, we have discovered my biggest fear. Are you ready for it? And so mm -hmm. every now juncture that I'm at, I ask my unanswerable, well, now it is an answerable question, but it's my big question, which is, is this going to kill me? <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I ask that question. If I say yes to Governor Pritzker and I serve in this administration and I bust my butt to make sure that all Illinoisans have a chance at human dignity and expanding their potential, am I going to die from that? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. I'm going to work really hard like I am. I'm going to be frustrated with the bureaucracy and the slow pace. We're going to have great wins and we're going to have to struggle through um, the reality that is our budget right now in the state of Illinois. Uh, but I do it knowing that I'm using up all of my talent and all of my mission and, and all of my energy. And I would encourage women and listeners um, to say, uh, again, be less scared faster. <laughs> I want to, I, I don't know if the listeners figured this out. You probably all did. Sol and I are sitting together, which is always a treat uh, in any circumstance, but particularly today. So I might even share a couple of photos I took kind of uh, on the sly here. But in all seriousness, I wanted to be right up close and personal with a woman who I just admire greatly and who is so inspirational. So, Sol, I want to thank you for joining thank us you. today. Yes, and thank hopefully you. we'll see you again. Yes. And uh, with that, we'll say good afternoon. The Vote Her In segment is a collaboration of Two Broads Talking Politics and author Rebecca Sive. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.